Welcome to Make Ready TV, where the world's most experienced farms instructors train you one-on-one -on -one in the comfort of your own home. I'm Matt Jaquies. And I'm Kaylee Jeans. In our tactical training segment, we go back to Nacogdoches, Texas with Paul Howe and check out his ball and dummy drill. And then for our self-defense segment, we're going to go talk to Louis Auerbuck down in Columbia, South Carolina, and he's going to go over target selection and self-defense. Nice. And then for our edged weapons segment, we're going down to Pembroke Pines, Florida, and James Williams is going to teach us about a move he calls Saving Private Ryan. Then we're going to close this one out with pro tips from Pat Rogers and Travis Haley. Now let's go to Paul Howe and check out his drill. All right, ball and dummy at 25. I like to do this drill in lieu of using snap caps. I like two people. Why? Snap caps are great, but you can't diagnose what you're doing wrong with snap caps. You can either shoot or you can analyze. You can't do both. So what we're going to do is use a second shooter. I'll be the diagnosing the shooter today. I use a, a triple bull. The triple bull down there, we're going to use high ready position. We're going to use holster and then we're going to use kneeling position. Now with the ball and dummy, a couple safety protocols. I need to make sure I'm familiar with his weapon system. All the things that you do at seven, you're not aware of, they're going to magnify at 25. They'll magnify here with the amount of rounds we fire through anticipation recoil, because after about nine, 10 rounds, you'll start to, mind will start to try to counteract what that gun is doing. The other thing is we'll see the hits on target, we can analyze those. So at this time, eyes and ears. Shooter, if you would, hand me your weapon system and a magazine. Thanks, sir. If you would, direct your attention over there. I'm gonna take the weapon system here, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna check it again. I'm going to keep it up and down range. We can run multiple shooters online doing the same drill. I'm going to take the magazine, insert it. I don't want him to know when I hand the weapon back to him if it's loaded or not. All right, this time, shooter, go ahead. We're going to start from a high ready position. And we can work his feet all the way up. And we can start this basically on his own, or we can use a timer to do this. Right now, I'm going to have him go ahead and push out on target doing all the fundamentals of marksmanship. We're gonna work top bull, top bull. When you're ready, shooter. Much better, much better. Fall through cover scan, all the mechanics right here. He'll hand me the gun. Again, he'll look away. Now what I can do, if he looks good, and he's doing all the fundamentals correctly, I can go ahead <clears throat> and set it up appropriately. All right, shooter. All right, looks good. Finger stayed on the trigger. Came out, did fo good fall through cover scan. All right. Make sure he's not cheating on me. Now how I set it up. And again, I've got a couple different solutions here. <clears throat> All right, sir, if you would. Okay, we're seeing that little dip, that anticipation, excuse me, anticipation recoil. So we're gonna need to clean that up. All right, sir. Again, we wanna keep the muzzle up and down range at all times. Again, you wanna be familiar with that weapon system. And again, I like them to earn that live shot. All right, sir. So I start the feet, work all the way up. I look at weight posture, look at his push out on the weapon system. And then I talk myself through lock, lock, front sight press. Go ahead, sir. All right, much better, much better. So he cleans it up. He cleans it up, looks, looking good. <clears throat> All right, so again, <clears throat> he won't know there's live or Memorex. That coughing is done to cover the sound. All right, ball and dummy, diagnostics. 
You do a lot of stuff at seven, and what'll happen is you'll make little mistakes. You won't see it. 25 will expand that distance, and what it'll do is magnify those mistakes. We've got to go back and forth between distance and up close and clean out those mistakes. 25 will keep you honest. What we can do is go down range now and look at the targets and diagnose each one to see what he was doing in the high ready. And again, you need a second person to watch you. You cannot watch yourself. Now, you could video yourself, but again, it'll be a delayed feedback. Right now, I can give him instant feedback on his actions and clean it up. I guess it's a very valuable tool. Make Ready TV is brought to you by FNH USA, Smith & Wesson, TNVC, and Pro Ears. That's a great version of the ball and dummy drill. That drill is priceless for an instructor to diagnose what a shooter's doing wrong. And Paul's got a great point. You need two people to do that to set that system up so they never know what's coming. Priceless. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to Columbia, South Carolina to Louis Auerbuck and go over his targets and self-defense training. Now it's on to targets, which is one of the cruxes of this video. Standard IPSC target, 18 inches wide, 23 and a half to 24 inch torso, six inch square head. 12 inch C zone, for which you're being given points. And then in addition, there's a D zone, for which you're being given points. Average human, adult human, nine inch breastplate. So this, as a one dimensional target, is a good mechanical training tool. But as far as fighting goes, it's got no relevance to human anatomy. Six foot one male, large man, 18 and a half inch to 19 inch torso from the shoulder down to the belt line. A five foot seven adult male, same length to within half an inch. Five foot three female, four inches shorter in the torso. There's the 18 and a half, that's 14 inches. So the IPSC flat target, not necessarily IPSC, but the flat cardboard target really is irrelevant to street fighting and shooting animals, two-legged animals, so to speak, even if they're vertical. They're oversized, they're too easy to hit, and offset to one side or the other, it makes no difference. You shoot for the center of a flat piece of cardboard where that doesn't apply on humans. So. This is a plastic three-dimensional body, which I'm going to use to illustrate the point. Same, this is, is built to correct standards, 18 and a half, that type of thing. The head is correct and everything else. So to my mind, and this is personal opinion, this is for the viewer to decide, is once you've got this and you have somebody hitting this belt buckle to belt buckle, then the time comes to start tilting it, which in essence shrinks the chest area. Because somebody is shooting three inches low consistently and hitting a vertical target in the stomach, which may or may not be effective, is now missing out this side. Head shots, same thing, complete miss. So this is somebody who's simulating rolled out around cover. Then you have somebody angled on which the three humans we had, so to speak, in the frame are all four inches deep this way, and that's it, from a six foot one male to a five foot three female. Elevation changes will change the shot. A horizontal target, there's only 20 degree allowance this way for most shots. A chest shot is pointless from, from the viewer's angle right now. It's too hard, the bullet's going to bounce off. A headshot is useless because you're looking at immediate incapacitation. If you hit him right between the running lights now, it's going ahead of the frontal lobes. It's not going to stop him. The whole objective of shooting somebody is immediate incapacitation. Whether he dies or not is a moot point. Similarly, from another angle, coming in this way. This shot needs to go in the top of the head or high in the abdomen. A chest shot's gonna bounce off very little leeway. So simulating somebody lying on a bed, you come into your bedroom, he's lying there, reaches for a gun in your house. This is what you've got. 
there's very little leeway for error. The aiming point is a criterion once you have the mechanical ability. So a body angle this way, this way, and or moving is not a mechanical function. It's a function, it's a brain function when somebody can manipulate the weapon and shoot accurately on a flat piece of paper. In through the top of the head, in through the high stomach, no higher, no lower, very little leeway for error, in through the crutch or just above, maybe into the lower abdomen that the bullet can traverse all the way through here. A headshot is useless unless the bullet goes in under here. And then it may be too far forward to shut him down immediately. So anatomy, extremely important to have anatomically correct targets on the range, in my opinion. But there's a reason people are missing close up in a gunfight. If you start sidestepping on this target, the geometric angle in which you have to insert that bullet or from which you have to insert it is exacerbated. This target is easier to hit from 15 yards than it is from three if you sidestep off it. A flat target is more difficult to hit further away because it's smaller and all you're doing is taking more time, more sight alignment, more, sight refi more trigger refinement. That's it. This, it's moving quickly, it's moving really quickly, the whole fight is moving quickly. You sidestep, you lose track of the backstop, which is worse close up than it is further because with inverse proportions, the background becomes larger, close up. Louis Auerbuck is legendary in this industry, yeah. much like your dad. He's another guy that I would love to train with, and he makes some extremely valid points. 3D targets, vice cardboard, I like it. Now let's go to Pembroke Pines, Florida with James Williams, where he's going to show us a knife move called Saving Private Ryan. This is not going to be a chapter on how to take a nap, although I'm fairly good at that. What we're going to do here is take a look at some situations that could evolve on the ground. And when I saw the movie Saving Private Ryan, I think we all remember the scene where the German soldier was down on top of the Jewish soldier. And as the German soldier kept pushing put his weight, the Jewish soldier kept trying to push the knife away and ended up being unsuccessful with that. So what we're going to look at here is some solutions to that particular situation. Again, Joe's going to help me. Now, this is a live blade. You can put a lot of pressure on the live blade. Of course, it's more dangerous, but it makes you pay more attention. That you can't put on the aluminum blade. So be careful when you start doing a training blade that you don't bend it all up. So as Joe starts putting his weight and pressure, all of it down, go ahead, put pressure. So I can only hold this for so long, and you can see I'm under a bit of stress here, but it's okay. Figure out which hand is the knife in, right. Leave my left hand on his right hand. Grab the knife, push it sideways. Keep the pressure on the back of the blade, and you can see it's now my knife. I've got the lever, it's my knife. Now we're not gonna go further with this, because we like to use our training partners multiple times. You have to be careful if you're using the live blade, but I recommend it at times because if he's putting pressure down and you've got to hold this and it's real pressure and you slip, well, as they say in Ireland, you're fucked. So you want to know that this works. It's important that you hold the hand that has the knife. You hold that wrist as you let go for the moment, okay? He can't then jerk back and jerk the knife out. And while I would not like to have my hand cut, that's not the real problem here. He gets the knife free, that's the real problem. So if he tries to jerk right now to pull it back out of the way, he can't do that. Go ahead and pull back, jerk that knife. He can't do that. I'm holding his arm that has the knife. And you keep bringing the tip around into him, okay? And because of the angle of the wrist, it now becomes my knife. Another way of doing this, depending upon circumstance, He's pushing down. I come over and I re-grab the whole business like this, okay? I take back of my arm, bring my elbow. Remember how we talked about that? Now bring it up. Go ahead, don't move, I got it, okay? And you have to manage it, okay? 
don't let these things fall on you because it will fall point first. That always happens to me. It will poke a hole in you even if it only falls six or eight inches. It seeks, it's what it was designed to do and it knows it. Okay, so let's get an aluminum blade real quick. So Joe's here, come here. Now, depending upon circumstance, right here, because I have grappling ability and knowledge, and if you do, I come up under, lift him up over me, cut him right through the femoral in the process, okay? So when you're working with this, take a look. First, you have to manage the blade. This is the lethal part of it. In managing the blade, you have to manage the person because he's the real problem. The knife's just a knife. But as you work these things back and forth, look for some other solutions once the knife becomes yours. What can I do here? If you have some other martial skills, okay, if you can perceive the situation, then there's lots of solutions that you can implement. So you can see, depending upon how the problem is being presented, and your particular knowledge and skill base that there are some other solutions here. As he's pressing down and the knife becomes mine and I recognize the leg up, I can slide under, bring him right over, make the cut on the femoral and roll back out. Do not stay on the ground. If you get to the ground, get off the ground. It is not the place to survive. So notice, I've got the knife, I saw the opening, I slid underneath, I cut him on the way out, I'm coming up, I've got the knife, I'm on my feet. I hate the thought of getting cut. That was a good way to get out of that situation and one that I wouldn't have thought out without James pointing it out. Saving Private Ryan's a great movie, by the way. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Upham. And yeah, nobody is having a good day when they get a knife up the femoral. Yikes. Anyway, now let's go to some pro tips. The Make Ready TV Pro Tips are presented by Battle Comp Enterprises. Loading and unloading a handgun. There's certain steps that I take to make sure I'm setting myself up for success in a competition or heading out into reality. First thing I'm going to do for range work is I'm going to put my eyes and my ears in. Okay. Second thing is I've got an unloaded weapon system on and I've got that source of ammunition ready to load. So loading considerations. I want to draw the gun on the target or a focus point on a wall or something somewhere and actually get a repetition in the draw, side alignment, and trigger control. Once I get that repetition, I'll reach down, insert a source of ammunition, power stroke the gun with good inertia to make sure a round goes in the chamber, do a proper press check, verifying a round in the chamber, forcing the slide home, and then holstering the gun. Now I'm set up 100% for success if I have to go get into a shooting or I'm about to go into that competition stage five seconds from now or 10 minutes from now or a day from now. Now, unloading the gun. First thing we're going to do, I'll get another repetition on the draw. I'll take the source of ammunition out and put it away. I will lock the slide to the rear and watch that round come out and hit the ground. I'll physically and visually look in the chamber and in the magwell, verifying that it's unloaded and showed clear. I will then send the slide forward, hammer down, and holster the gun. This verifies that I have 100% unloaded gun. Now you can get buddy checks left and right, whatever you want to do, but you are responsible for the condition of your gun. So make sure you do that properly. Keep the gun in your workspace. Get those extra repetitions. Take that opportunity and time to do so because you're adding more consistent repetition in your life. That's going to make you a better shooter. Well, situational awareness is generally projected out. We also want to bring that situational awareness in to our weapon. We need to understand what condition this weapon is in at all times. Too often, we'll see people on a range with no magazines in their pistol, no ammunition in the chamber. And while on the range, this may be embarrassing. In real life, it could be fatal. Our procedure after we engage is to make sure that our weapon is up before we engage the mechanical safety. And this way, we know what we have rather than guess it. What we will do after we shoot is take our index finger. Feel for the bolt to make sure the bolt is in battery. I'm not looking at it because at night or in low light, it may not be available to see. And in most instances, I need to be looking for something else that's going on out there. 
Once I am sure that this bolt is closed, I'm going to close the dust cover. This dust cover is a check to me so that I know I have ensured the bolt is in battery. Make Ready TV is brought to you by Brownells, The SIG Academy, Rand Innovations, and Core Bond. You know, Matt, I love the pro tips because they're a great way to get a lot of information in a really small amount of time. Absolutely. And that dust cover, that pesky little dust cover, seems to be something <laughs> only us former Marines seem to talk about. Yeah. All right. For more information on one-on-one -on -one training from our instructors, either online streaming video or DVD, make sure and check out our website at makereadytv.com. That's it for this week. And remember, when you're training, specifically alone and in your house, dry fire training, for instance, we want you to make sure that you're safe. Unload, make sure it's safe and empty, double check. And as always, we want you to train smart, train often, victory first. The Make Ready DVDs are available from brownells.com. <laughs>